I said earlier on that the NHS crisis was all over the paper, so let me demonstrate. Sunday Mirror, flawed NHS, a picture of a, a, a little girl there sitting on the floor of a ward. Um, Mail on Sunday says, in a poll, 78% of people would back cutting foreign aid in order to fund the NHS better. Um, and then there's the Observer Health Service in crisis. Now cancer operations are being cancelled, it says. The other big story, I think, is Brexit. Sunday Times has gone on a Trump-Putin summit as their splash, but they have a story here. May, Theresa May, calls for a clean and hard Brexit. And what they say there is that on Wednesday she's going to say that we're going to leave both the customs union and the single market, or at least indicate that. And if you doubt the Sunday Times, not that you would, there's the Sunday Telegraph, May's big gamble on a clean Brexit, they call it. Of course, the word ahead of Brexit, the adjective is now always propagandistic. It's clean, it's soft, it's hard, it's brutal, it's pink, it's oatcake flavoured, it's whatever you like. Uh, so let's go to the papers. Where are we starting? Are we starting with Brexit? Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about the Sunday Times front page is that it captures just how much hardball Theresa May is going to play next week on Tuesday when she makes this big speech on Brexit. Um, it's very unusual to have politicians talking about the pound. But here we have number 10 briefing. There could be a market correction in of the wake of the, the speech. the pound going down. The pound going down. They're already bracing us for what's going to happen in the wake of it. And also, David Davis has written in the Sunday Times something very significant, talking about a transitional deal. If it proves necessary, we have said we'll consider time for implementation of new arrangements. So this shows it's not just about hard Brexit or soft Brexit. It's about whether it's a quick or a, fa or a slow yeah. Brexit. And so it looks like a bit harder, but a bit slower, seems to be the message. Exactly. And let's be clear, Aisha, this is not really surprising uh, that Theresa... I mean, if she's, she said all the way through that we have to have control taken back of immigration, that means leaving the single market. So that's not a surprise. And if she wasn't going to leave the customs union, then she wouldn't have set up an, uh, an entire department to do international trade duties under Liam Fox. So nothing is surprising, but it's still quite a moment. It absolutely is a moment, as you say. I mean, I think she's made her position quite clear. She's leaned in very much to look, I would favour immigration control over membership of the single market. But look, we talked about the um, adjectives that people use, and I think that's what the country, that was a signal that the country gave, and I think that's why she's going with it. But don't forget what Philip Hammond said as well. He said people didn't vote for Brexit to be worse off. So I hope that we will not have a broke Brexit or a breadline Brexit at the end of Absolutely. all of this. Well, there's a very interesting news story in Welt am Sonntag, not our usual Sunday ring, a German Sunday newspaper, in which Philip Hammond is quoted saying that if we don't get the market access we want, then we'll have a different economic model, by which he seems to mean slashing corporation tax, doing a low tax island off the, off the continental system. So that is, in a sense, that's the threat he's holding over the European And that's leader. the worry, obviously, of a lot of people who voted Remain, is that actually we could see a cliff edge and there could be a real problem. Of course, when Theresa May just sneezes about hard Brexit, the markets catch a cold. So we'll see what the reactions are going to be on Tuesday. But people Esther, you've want chosen the Sunday Express. Though. Yes, it May's Brexit battle plan. But it is uh, living up to the expectations and the votes of the British public who said Brexit. There was no hard, there was no soft, there was no red, white and blue. It is just Brexit. These different sort of adjectives uh, have been brought about fundamentally by people who wanted to remain. And that wasn't what the British public wanted, which was uh, control over borders. So there wasn't free movement. Uh, they didn't want to pay into a system they didn't think was working. And they also wanted control over the law. So what she is doing is delivering as best as possible, because she said what it's the best for. deal for the UK. And interestingly, the e EU don't recognise the term single market. It's known as the internal market. So I think that in itself says if we're you not going to be an right. internal part of this system, we're not going to be a part of the single market. But what we're looking for is uh, no tariffs. That's what we want. We want the best deal for the UK and to live up to what all those millions of people came out and said we want for the UK. And yet, in terms of what people really voted for, Aisha, there's a poll um, which has suggested that if people think they're going to actually be worse off in any way at all, they don't want to leave. I mean, if people want, inevitably, I guess people want everything. We had the sort of the, the doomsday scenarios, and a lot of that have now been uh, sort of blown recalibrated, away. blown away. We've heard that even the sort of chief economist for the Bank of England said, we've had the Michael Fish moment. We got that wrong. This isn't happening. You've seen FTSE 100 going up. You've seen employment still going up. You've seen the fact that uh, growth was still the best in the G7 on growth. So all these doomsday scenarios are not the case. Yes, there will be an adjustment. Yes, we know 
the pound uh, might have to stabilize or or whatever terms feel best but at the end of the day it's the the, yes but we know there will be a sort of a recalibration, but at the end of the day, it will be positive for the UK because we're an okay. international country. Yeah. We've got to look to the Are world. Sure? We all hope that it will be positive, and we've got to try and you know make this work to the, to the best we can. But don't, in the same way that you know you would say to Remainers, accept the result. Um, I think it's acceptable for the other side to understand people do have some anxieties about the prospects of this country. It's not a bad thing you, to worry about people's... You've chosen the story in the Observer there. Yeah, the show, so um, Keir, Keir Starmer. Starmer, who is um, Labour's Brexit spokesperson, has written, um, and he obviously accepts that this is coming forward, but he's, he wants some particular um, conditions to be met. He wants there to be some guarantees given before Article 50 negotiations begin. And also he wants some um, certainty for the two and a half million EU citizens that currently reside in the UK. But look, the Labour Party has also got to get its act together in terms of Brexit and what our position is. Brexit is happening. Immigration is a really important part of the story. And I think we need some clarity from the Labour Party about what the Labour Party's position is on freedom of movement. Well, thank you very much for that, because we're going to move on to one of the constituencies which voted 70% to leave the EU, which is Stoke-on-Trent Central, losing its MP. There's the observer, Esther. Um, Tristram Hunt, who is leaving to be director of the VNA, a very, very big and prestigious job, and he's going to do it very well, I'm sure. But nonetheless, a bit of a blow for the Labour Party, because they now face a second difficult by-election in their heartland territories. Mm. I mean, this has to be a headache for uh, Labour, particularly uh, sort of Corbynista Labour. Um, you've got, as you say, two by-elections here, two uh, moderate Labour MPs leaving. But as I looked at it sort of strategically on a bigger picture, I guess moderate Labour have never known how they're going to seize back control of their own party as they say it. They tried to do a leadership bid. It didn't happen. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was voted back mm. with a, a greater amount. So how are they going to do it? And what you're going to see is one by one, these moderate Labour MPs saying, well, we might not survive because boundary changes could have got rid of Tristram or deselection threats could have got rid of Tristram. So if they one by one start moving out like this this is a form of destabilization so that as moderate a sort of labor can... general election as it yes. were bit by bit on the other hand you could say that in this particular seat ukip and the tories are almost second equal behind labor it's a very interesting question for the tories do they fight the seat very very hard and help labor in a sense by keeping ukip down or do they stand back a bit and let ukip try to win the seat well, UKIP came second to this seat uh, in this seat anyway. I think it's interesting in the, this uh, newspaper article that a lot of people there who are all Labour voters, strong Labour area, did not vote enthusiastically at all for Labour in 2015. Only a 49.9% turnout. They were saying they just didn't want to um, yes, vote for the Tories, but their Brexit is... has been described as the least popular MP <laughs> in the House of Commons based on the actual number of people who voted for him. So in Sorry this about that, instance, Hunt, I would wouldn't have the Conservative Party in second place. I would have UKIP, uh, who would ah, be the main okay. threat here. Uh, Paul Nuttall, the leader, I think it would be a good seat for him to go for. Well, that would be a heck of a story and if Paul Nuttall took Stoke on Trent. Well, I think that will. If I was Paul Nuttall, this is the seat I would be going for. This is where I would be putting all my ammunition. And, uh, and right. that could be a possible win and a terrible so, loss for Labour. So Esther said that just now that um, this could happen again and again. And Paul, you've got a story in the Sunday Times suggesting that very same thing but I think a little bit thin on detail if I may say so sometimes. it is a bit I mean it's a great headline dozens of MPs are ready to flee Corbyn and have, have many many more by-elections however I mean I, I, my understanding of the PLP is that at least maybe possibly maximum of two are gonna possibly really walk um, th what's interesting about this is Jeremy Corbyn you're going to interview him later um, is going to address the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, tomorrow night on Monday to start off the new year his new message um, and it'll be interesting to see just the mood there because previously a, a year ago that was Monday night was fight night whenever you went the Labour MPs were really having a pop <laughs> at Jeremy Corbyn the mood has changed and also don't forget Jeremy um, Tristram Hunt and um, Jamie Reid who have both decided to leave Westminster have left on good terms they've left not ha having a pop at Jeremy Corbyn no, they why haven't. because the Blairites and the centrists in the party don't want to be blamed for the poor state of the party in the polls they say look look let Jeremy be Jeremy let Corbyn okay. be Corbyn and let him stand on, on his own two feet and see what the public think about it okay
Uh, Aisha, let's move on to the other really big story of the day. As I said, NHS absolutely everywhere. A lot of people will wonder, is this a real new crisis? Because we read this kind of stuff week after week, month after month. Well, I think it is a crisis. There's a very powerful um, story and picture on the front page of the Sunday Mirror, as you said, about a little girl who's um, been lying on the floor for eight hours. And in the inside pages, we have uh, Jonathan Ashworth, the Labour health spokesperson, saying that there is a crisis and that the Prime Minister is denying it. Look, the health service is always stretched. No matter how much money you put into it, there's always um, issues. But there's some things we, we have to look at. We have got massive problem. We need more funding in the NHS. It's not just about and the money. The question is how. And the, the Mail on Sunday suggests taking money from the foreign aid budget. But Paul Wall, there's a very interesting poll that the independents carried out there, which yeah. suggests that if people, well, I'll let you, I'll let you tell. Well, there's, there's bad news and good news for the Labour Party here. Theresa May and the Tories will do a better job than Labour with the NHS this winter. More people think amongst the general public that Theresa May can handle the winter crisis better than Labour. Now given Labour's put all its chips on this particular bit of the uh, political agenda, that's, that's quite a blow. Uh, What's good news is that 47% of the public agree with the Red Cross as a humanitarian crisis, but opposition really is about responding to crisis and coming up with your own really solution. really interestingly, when people are asked how would we fund the NHS crisis, a majority of people say that if we had a hypothecated tax, that is an extra tax specifically for the NHS, they would pay more tax to save the NHS. Yeah, and I think Whether that's we believe them or not is another question, yeah, I that's think, what they say. I think different people have said they'd choose for it to be paid for in different ways, but what you have seen is that the budget has gone up from 100 billion in 2010, it's mm -hmm. now 116, it will go up to 129 billion by 2020. Yes, so you've got to say, to how are we best best to pay for this? Is it going to be, because people are realistic, they know there's only a certain amount of money in the sort of budget, and is it going to now come from foreign aid? Because we all believe that we've so got to see well, a I'll, be, I'll, be about, I'll be talking about this with, with Jeremy Corbyn in a moment. We're almost out of time, but Aisha, I want to talk about your Trump story before yes. we finish. Well, Trump has gone to war with a man called John Lewis, not the department store, um, a very prominent uh, black activist in America who, who said, look, I don't think he's sort of fit to be president, and he has really attacked him. And I think as we look ahead to the inauguration, we, uh, we're all agog as to see what he's going to be, but I think we mustn't underestimate how worried people are in America about the clock being turned back on things like racial inequality, civil liberties, human rights, women's rights. So I think that's something that people are very, very worried about. And, you know, I, I really, really hope yeah. that he doesn't, um, you know, he is a man with a big fat ego and a very thin skin. And I hope that when he's president, put, yeah. Well, there's a lot more. If you're interested in Donald Trump, there's a lot about Donald Trump and the spy and all the rest of it throughout the papers. But we have run out of time. Thank you all very much indeed. And so